to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. It is the afternoon of the 10th of July, 2015, here in Washington, D.C., and we are witnessing convulsive events in Europe. However, not without promise, provided that one has the patience and the seriousness to wait for these events to mature. First of all, our starting point is the austerity psychosis of the German regime, which we've talked about in previous weeks, that Abbauwahn that was talked about by uh, Anton Erkelenz back in the Weimar Republic. Today it's Abbauwahn to the 10th power on a continental scale. And uh, what we're actually seeing is that some of these individuals uh, really ought to be committed to institutions, institutions of therapeutic confinement. They are ready for the padded cell, the, the canvas blazer in many cases. First among them, the unfortunate Wolfgang Schäuble, who has now become a mask of cynicism, nihilism, and indeed hatred, tinged with, with racism against the Greeks, right? The typical North-South uh, European divide. So what do we hear from uh, Schäuble in the last a couple of days? We're told that uh, he says that uh, the it's true. He says the, the International Monetary Fund staff report, says Schäuble, is correct. The Greek debt is unsustainable, cannot be repaid. And that's clear. However, then he says, because of the European treaties, it is impossible to grant debt relief in the form of a haircut. <laughs> Wait a minute. You, Schäuble, already piloted an earlier haircut, which was designed to save the interests of Deutsche Bank and others that are your masters. Uh, and you're picking on Greece because they're small and weak and isolated, and you can play on this unfortunate German uh, attitude towards what they call Kanaken. Anything south and east becomes Kanaken, and you can see that's what's going through this guy's head. So we condemn that. Uh, I would also point out, let's, let's state loudly and clearly that the Treaty of Rome is not a suicide pact. The Treaty of Maastricht is not a suicide pact. And even the Treaty of Lisbon, which is a big step down from those, uh, each one is a step down from the previous one. Treaty of Lisbon is not a suicide pact. The European treaties are not a suicide pact. There's got to be some overriding principle. You have not been put in command of the European Union, you oligarchs and eurogarchs, to lead it over a cliff. Even the very dubious and fishy Aristotle had a concept called epikeia, equity. You've got to try to save the epikeia or equity interest of the participants. And this means debt relief. 50% is your starting point, and then you can take it up from there. Now, Schäuble's mental instability also came to the fore in an event in Frankfurt, where he said that he had received a phone call from U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Lew, L-E-W. Uh, and this time, Lew was apparently talking a little bit of sense. Uh, just the fact that Lew calls him probably indicates that some arm twisting is going on. Well, give him the hammerlock and, uh, and make him cry uncle. So what uh, Schäuble then told the group in, in Frankfurt was he had said to Lew, we Europeans, or we Germans, maybe he said, will give you Greece and we'll take Puerto Rico in exchange. And then the part that shows the growing insanity of Schäuble is he said, Lou thought I was joking. The implication being that he was serious and therefore he really thought that it would be time to exchange Greece, bankrupt Greece in his view, for bankrupt uh, Puerto Rico and the municipal uh, bond market implications. Now, that indicates that Schäuble is uh, approaching a nervous breakdown or already going through 
a nervous breakdown. Let me lay down the party line here of the Tax Wall Street Party. We want Merkel out. It is time for what the Germans called a constructive vote of no confidence. Ein konstruktives Misstrauensvotum. I think the last of those were, what, 40 years ago with the Reiner Barzel of the CDU against Willy Brandt. Uh, we want it now by any and all members of the Bundestag. Hey, Linke, where are you? Why don't you bring in a constructivis misstrauens votum? You got to break the ice somewhere. You look at something like Watergate. It takes a while to get these entrenched office holders out, but you got to begin the process. We want a vote of no confidence against uh, Merkel and her out. Uh, remember, at the same time, in, under the German system, because of the Weimar experience, you've got to specify who should be chancellor. In other words, if you want a chancellor out, it's not enough to say we all agree he should be out or she should be out. You've also got to get everybody to unite around a successor. Fine. Let's. <clears throat> why not put forth this Sarah Wagenknecht? She's as good as as anybody, I would say, from Die Linke, right? She might be the the one with the most fighting spirit that we can see. Uh, but then, of course, that would not be acceptable to all of them. So then she could then gracefully yield to some other figure, maybe from a revived SPD. I don't know. We'd have to get more information about this. But the point is Merkel out and Schäuble should uh, really resign because he is a very sick man. He's about as sick as George H.W. Bush during his thyroid storm episodes of uh, early 1992, uh, when he uh, was obviously in, a, in very bad uh, physical and psychological condition. We also have the tirade of this character, Manfred Weber. This is a true monstrosity, right? Reaching into the lowest drawer of resentment and hatred with remarks tinged by the racism that we associate with an earlier German regime, Manfred Weber of the Bavarian CSU delivered an attempted uh, philippic uh, against Tsipras, who politely listened. I think Tsipras might have been considering, should I walk out? But he stayed, uh, and that was courageous. And I think that was probably a smart thing to do because that shifted the onus to Weber. If you walk out, then you become the issue. If Weber shoots his mouth off and you listen and even take notes, then uh, then Weber is the issue. Uh, Weber is some kind of a regurgitation of the earlier darker trends of German history. And his line was that Tsipras is a liar, that Tsipras uh, doesn't keep his commitments, a trustworthy. And then we got this tirade we love compromise, says Weber. You, Tsipras, love provocation. We love success. You love failure. We try to unite Europe. You split Europe. Why don't you come and apologize for the, the Greek behavior? Uh, and I, I'm afraid that this psychosis of austerity in Germany, perhaps combining all the accumulated resentments and unspeakable sorrows of the two lost wars, the humiliation of the occupation, uh, the territorial changes that were then imposed, I, I think there's some kind of a pent-up hysteria that somehow is being unloaded on Greece, which Greece uh, does not deserve, and which uh, the world community cannot tolerate. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So we're we're going through uh, some comments on the uh, the current state of the German regime, and Merkel, because if she goes, then the door to reason, rationality, and humanity might indeed open up. And uh, there's by far not uh, unanimity in in uh, Ger in Germany about this uh, crazy uh, course, right? And in particular, I would, if you can read German, I would take a look at something called the Deutsche Wirtschaftsnachrichten, which apparently is owned by the Swedish Bonnier Verlag uh, company. And um, they have some interesting um, views 
on these things, and they're decidedly critical of uh, of Merkel. They say that Merkel they re they reproduce things from Bloomberg, where Bloomberg says that Merkel is tormenting the European economy. That uh, U.S. Secretary of the Treasury Jack Lew thinks that the European leaders are a bunch of amateurs. That Lew has been saying there is no need for a catastrophic crash of the Greek economy. And that there should be debt relief. And apparently this uh, U.S. pressure behind the scenes is beginning to add up. Not only the Deutsche Wirtschaftsnachrichten say so, but also the Daily Telegraph with Ambrose Evans Pritchard. And, uh, you know, gold is where you find it. So Ambrose Evans Pritchard is talking about a united front of the United States with Lou, France with uh, Prime Minister Valls, Italy Renzi and company fearing contagion, no doubt, and probably getting some contagion, and even the IMF, that now about a, about a week ago it looked like there was a civil war inside the IMF, that the IMF staff was saying there's got to be debt relief, there's got to be a haircut, it's unsustainable, and this was then, there was an attempt to suppress it, but it came out. At that point, uh, Madame Lagarde, uh, leaving her tanning bed, uh, began saying, no, no, we've got to have absolutely every penny paid back. Something happened to her. She was flipped over the weekend, right? Maybe maybe the U.S. threatened her with a, a Strauss-Kahn scandal in reverse, right? I'm sure she's vulnerable to things like this. So so now Lagarde is saying that there have to, it has to be flexibility and, and even some kind of uh, debt forgiveness, Um of course, Schäuble continues to say no, and Merkel, uh, in her malevolence and stupidity, this grave digger of finance capital and <laughs> indeed grave digger of Europe, and it's fine to be, you know, gloating about the predicament of the finance capitalists, but where's the alternative? Who's who's ready to govern in their stead? Some of us would be in theory, but we don't have the organized muscle to make these decisions. Uh, you know, into reality. So uh, it's going to take a little time. Um, so we have this. Um, the French Prime Minister, Valls, says France will not allow the Greek exit, the Grexit. And he says this is the interest of France to maintain the integrity of the European Union and the Eurozone, and we will not allow this to happen to uh, Greece. So again, U.S., France, Italy, and IMF, politics making strange bedfellows. And notice, we're even reminded that uh, some years back when this all started, Schäuble did not want the International Monetary Fund involved because he said they're softies, and in particular, they are controlled by the U.S., right, since the U.S. still has the majority of the voting shares. Uh, the U.S. is apparently, I, I'm, I'm, I'm flabbergasted, the U.S. finance, right, the Treasury, is actually, on the surface at least, exercising a, a benign influence on this. In other words, telling stupid Merkel, there's more at stake here than your stupid euros and your stupid, greedy CDU, CSU reactionary voters, right, who are worried about my money, my money, my money. That's not the whole story. There's also geopolitics. So they say, well, you know, Greece has been a pretty loyal member of uh, NATO. They were out of it for a while in the 70s and 80s, but they came back, and, um, and therefore you owe them something. Uh, and above all, you don't want to lose them. And you don't want to have the Chinese flag planted in Europe. No, and that's – I don't think we need it. China is doing fine. They don't need any more gifts. Uh we're actually one interesting uh, statistic that was cited today. Lehman Brothers, the Lehman Brothers catastrophe gave the Chinese a 10 year bonus in overtaking the US. 10 years were thrown away and continue to be thrown away by this lunatic, rotten US regime of finance capitalists and their minions and the two political parties. These people, you look at those Republican, I think we're up to 17 Republican faces. And the Democrats, same story. They tend to guarantee Chinese world domination in the short run. And uh, again, if you don't like U.S. world domination, you're not going to like Chinese world domination either. The great Han will, I think, 
in some ways, uh, actually outclass these uh, Wall Street dummies in certain uh, categories. So this is uh, the, uh, the current uh, picture. French technocrats have been sent to Athens to offer some kind of assistance. Who knows what this is? Uh, and according to the Daily Telegraph, Tsipras is successfully overcoming a rebellion of the Syriza ultra lefts. Right? Uh, there, there are, of course, uh, the KKE. These wonderful guys, the KKE, who never had a positive proposal in uh, in decades. The anti-austerity dem uh, demonstrators, right, as if on call from Berlin, are uh, protesting outside the Greek parliament in Syntagma Square, and they're still against austerity. Uh, that's fine. We'll talk about this later. Uh, we're going to talk about Lenin at Brest Litovsk, or Lenin's reaction to the Brest Litovsk negotiations with Germany, and what it means when you're facing a determined enemy who can destroy you, how you have to maneuver, how you have to temporize, prevaricate, play for time, deception postures, and all the rest. And in those days, it was Radek, ultra-left, and Bukharin, who soon became the ultra-right. So I'm going to talk, what's going to say, revolution speak to the various people who are telling us that... Uh, that it can't be done. So uh, we're told uh, that um, the left platform uh, is, this would be the hard left wing of Syriza. They have finally agreed to back Tsipras as of what, uh, 6.30 in the evening European time today, or, or maybe it's even 4.30 European time. Uh, so they're, they're supporting Tsipras, right? And um, five rebels are rejecting the terms the other 65 will vote yes and there will be enough votes from other political forces to pass it so uh that's what you have to do and we'll we'll put that in perspective uh from the greek angle and also from the historical angle. back in a minute welcome back to world crisis radio we're hearing about a new opera which is going into production. It's called Schäuble Meets the Barber of Seville and has to agree to a haircut. There's going to have to be a haircut. The bondholders are going to have to cough up significantly. Now, the problem here is the infinite duplicity and malevolence of the Eurogarchs. We are told that the austerity proposal for Greece, uh, is, it does not include as an integral part this uh, issue of the uh, haircut, right? Now, Merkel said, we can't do a debt write-down. We can only do other things like lower the interest rate, prolong the maturities, do some other things. Um, it's going to take uh, the full 1953 treatment, which Germany enjoyed, notwithstanding the Nazi crimes. Germany got the haircut in London, 1953, one half of the debt canceled, wiped out. Reciprocity is the great rule of international politics. What you do to the other guy will be done to you. And if it's good, then you can you can also uh, benefit. So uh, the U.S., the Anglo-Saxon media do not register the fact of this, uh, somehow this convergence of U.S., France, Italy, IMF, to put the CDU, CSU clowns in Berlin under pressure, right? In the end, this is this racist Manfred Weber uh, coming out. Uh, Schäuble, the, the uh, German term, this was once applied, I think, by Franz Josef Strauss back in the early 80s, running for chancellor against Helmut Schmidt, uh, suggested Schmidt was reif für den Nervenheilanstalt. <laughs> he was ready for the... Uh, the uh, the loony bin. He was he was ready to be put in a psychiatric ward, um, and I'm afraid that's now that's now Schäuble. So get Schäuble out of there. Use use the fact of his health. Um, we're also seeing crazy stuff in the uh, the bad guy coalition, right? The uh, we've got this Polish uh, member of the European Parliament, a guy called Janusz Korwin-Mikke, 
who gets up, he's protesting something about tickets, and he goes through, uh, he mouths a couple of slogans, which are themselves regurgitations of the NS uh, time, uh, and then gives the Hitler salute on the floor of the European Parliament. And the uh, Polish foreign minister has had to, uh, to uh, respond to that. The big day was Thursday when uh, Donald Tusk, who is a stooge of Merkel, uh, came out and said, well, uh, if the Greeks are reasonable and allow some further uh, austerity measures, then we have to turn our attention to the creditors, and they will also have to step up to the plate and make uh, some sacrifices. Now, here's my advice to Syriza. Play for time. Gain time. Maneuver. Prevaricate. Temporize. Do whatever it takes. Merkel and her CDU CSU, she's supposed to be this, uh, uh, what can we say, Empress Theodora of Europe. The CDU CSU is a minority. They can't form the government by themselves. They rely on coalition partners. Try to break that coalition. Uh, I would also say to the Greeks, what are you doing with your embassies? What are you doing? Your embassies should be contacting German trade unionists and explaining to them what they're going to lose if the European uh, currency and indeed the EU begin to break up. Uh, what are those Greek missions doing? Why don't they contact friendly forces? How come they haven't procured at least some allies, right? Maybe you can get somebody in Central America. Maybe you can get somebody far away to, uh, to uh, have a conference about countries that are sick of debt. Why doesn't Greece begin to lead a group of African countries who are crushed by debt um, and, uh, and some others, right? Maybe you, there are various candidates. We don't need to, uh, to mention them because some, then some of them freak out. Uh, Merkel is vulnerable. We could get a, a vote of no confidence against her. Uh, even so, if she wants another term, it's unlikely that she, uh, well, she, she might have some serious trouble getting it. The goal has got to be to get Merkel out, break up this combination, get Schäuble in the loony bin and Merkel in retirement, and then you're done. Uh, use the fact that you've split the French-German alliance. My God, this is a big deal. As long as you had France and Germany on a full lunatic austerity line, the situation was grim. And instead, right now they're split. You've also succeeded in playing the U.S. against Merkel on this issue, right? Merkel is saying money, money, money. And the U.S. is saying geopolitics, 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 and that is going to prevail. As again, Ambrose Evans Pritchard is talking about the, you know, the awesome power of the U.S. diplomacy. Well, at least it does count for something. Uh, and now, finally, Lou has made his voice heard uh, a little bit. How about this? Make a deal with Merkel and have some debt relief built into it. Uh, Merkel will have to exhaust her political capital to get that. Um, deal passed the Bundestag, the parliament in Berlin, and then get rid of her. In other words, that, that will weaken her to the point where she might fall, say, in the next crisis. Maybe it's the Ukrainian crisis. Play for time. Allies may emerge. Your biggest problem and the, the, the original sin that has come to this situation is how can you dream of organizing on a one country basis when you're confronting the 28 nations of the European Union and what, the 18 or 19 that are members of the Euro. How could you even dream of this? When I started organizing in Europe in 1970, 71, it was clear it had to be a European wide effort. And I started it in Germany, co-founding an organization there, then going on to Italy and founding an organization there with my two hands, crossing the border with nothing, no money, no nothing, just the old noggin and two hands. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, then you got to spread it from there, right? Why aren't you holding conferences? Why aren't you reaching out, right? Break with this narrow chauvinism. I think this is a real factor in the situation. So uh, reach out to Spain, reach out to Portugal, try to, try to get involved in the um, political process there. Those might become friendly states. Then the other question is, Will the collapse spread? Well, China is down one third, right? It stabilized a little bit at the end of the week. Um, that's already something, right? They said, well, they're, they're sort of isolated and fenced off. But uh, no, um, 
3.5 trillion dollars of losses in China plus 1.5 trillion or 2 trillion over Greece. The, the uh, world uh, financier oligarchy has taken it on the chin to the tune of five to six trillion in the last month or so. That's those are big bucks. Ukraine may blow. Then you get in there and you say, oh, I see you're giving debt relief to Ukraine who are not members, who have never done anything. And we're not going to get it. Then you appeal to the smaller Eastern Europeans and say, look, that could be you, right? Something goes sour, goes south on you. You're going to want help. And these ugly Germans are going to say no. You, Merkel is going to say no uh, and so forth. Um, and behind Ukraine, of course, remember Argentina, Venezuela and others that we haven't been mentioning, but which are prominent on the list of these uh, brokers. Now there's also the BRICS, right? In other words, play for time. And maybe conditions will improve. I think they are for a country like Greece. They will improve. The BRICS. We have an anti-austerity measure, a message coming out of the BRICS. The South African trade minister, Rob Davies, says it's time to end the policies of mindless austerity. Good. That's exactly it. We're told by Putin that the Iran sanctions must end. How can you expect Russia itself the target of NATO and U.S. sanctions to continue on this uh, Western line of uh, attempting to quell the Iranian peaceful nuclear program. Putin has now said it's time for Iran sanctions to end. But in the middle of all this, the BRICS, the BRICS have been meeting. The, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I believe, and, and the BRICS have been meeting in Ufa, Russia. Start making loans. Start making infrastructure loans to Greece. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley reporting from Washington, D.C. Now, we want to go to Athens just a minute and get a direct report. Let me just... Um, Set the stage a little bit. Uh, the London Daily Telegraph, Ambrose Evans Pritchard reported last Sunday, right after the successful no vote had won the Greek referendum, which was a great international event, that there was a more radical force inside Syriza that wanted to seize control of the Bank of Greece, use the physical capability that they have with the plates and the printing presses to print 20 euro notes that would be real euros, not funny money. And they would justify this with the emergency clauses of the Lisbon Treaty, which apparently say that if Frankfurt uh, doesn't answer, you can go ahead and do it yourself. And at the same time, take that to the European court and also uh, impugn Draghi for dereliction of uh, duty. And the story then was that um, Varoufakis was more in favor of a uh, California 2008 IOU system, which I believe was done under Governor Schwarzenegger, unless I'm very much mistaken. Uh, so that would have been another way uh, to do it. And that, of course, was then followed by the um, unexpected resignation of Varoufakis. So uh, de there's a debate inside Syriza. And right now, as we speak, there's still, I believe, still a debate in the European Parliament, the uh, international uh, meeting, uh, media say the left platform, that is the, the left wing of Syriza, has now, by a uh, big majority, said they will support Syriza. There are five uh, people who are going to vote against it, but it uh, looks like it uh, it's going to go through. So let's get the background on all of that from Michael Chiotinas in Athens. Welcome, Michael. Hello, Dr. Tarpley. <laughs> go right ahead. Um, yeah, you see... The only thing, the funny thing is that this thing about printing 20s and getting control of the central bank, of the Bank of Greece, was never reported nowhere uh, in the Greek media. Uh, the only thing that we huh? heard on this is that Varoufakis was going to use the option of the IOUs um, for a short period of time. Uh, up until, uh, I don't know, it's just to keep negotiations going without blackmail. And we also uh, heard that Varoufakis was the one that wanted to use legal action against uh, the European Central Bank. That's all that was reported. So, uh, I don't know about the, uh, any of these. 
Well, let, no. me, let me just, for our listeners, right, this was the London Daily Telegraph, the London Guardian, the Wall Street Journal all had some version of the story. But the Varoufakis part of it could easily be that thing about going to the European court. Draghi is derelict because he's not providing liquidity. And you could then use the emergency clauses of the uh, the Treaty of, uh, of Lisbon, right, some years back. And that would be a state of emergency, and you could begin to print liquidity. I sub like, suppose the Russians took over Frankfurt, right? What would you do? Yes. You'd have to yes, print, right? Yes, of course. But that, that would take time. The legal actions would uh, require uh, time. And <laughs> liquidity was running out, so he had to use some kind of liquidity. So maybe that's where the IOUs come in. But the thing is that the, the, this route was... Um, shown uh, to be a, the road to an ex to a Grexit, towards a Grexit. So this was stopped on grounds of being um, a, uh, um, towards the path of a Grexit, which uh, Syriza is committing, is committed not to go to. Um, Syriza is committed, this government is commi committed to the Euro. Uh, so that's all, that's all I know on this. Okay. Um, can you tell us something about the factional alignments inside Syriza, what they represent, or is it according to the, to the lineage of these groups, or is it regional or ideological? What, what's going on in there? Syriza, from the start, was uh, up, uh, up until when it was um, electorally 4%, uh, it was a coalition of small um, parties, small groups, small leftist groups, some of them uh, communists, other socialists, other uh, moderate centrists. Um, all these components came in to um, form this coalition and in order to unite the left in, in a way. Uh, right now, inside the parliamentary group of Syriza, uh, the communists, the, this, these small parties that will oppose um, Tsipras' uh, plan for an agreement are, are, are very small numbers, uh, maybe uh, two or three or four. And I, I think the left platform, which is the actual opposition inside Syriza, um, is going to oppose uh, inside Syriza, is going to uh, express its opposition inside Syriza, but in the end, mm -hmm. it's going to vote for the agreement and support this government because it's a de facto a vote of confidence, um, as you might imagine. Now, can I can I then ask you, in, in, in the people in the left platform who say don't accept this deal, do they then propose an alternative? Do they have a, another way to do things? They propose um, that. Syriza should build a plan B, essentially, which Syriza okay. doesn't have um, up until now. And it doesn't have a plan B because if it, if, if it did have a plan B, it wouldn't get to power <laughs> uh, that easily because there are strong forces against a return to national currency in the, inside mm -hmm. me, the media and the oligarchy and Europe, of course. Money mm -hmm. is being thrown um, towards campaigns against uh, national currency. Okay, well, I, I, you know, in terms of Plan B, uh, I feel personally involved because I essentially wrote about a little bit less than two weeks ago. I tried to provide a Plan B, not with the idea that I had decided, you know, that I was saying get out of the euro. No, no, no. Stay in the euro and fight, but you have to accept the possibility that you may be forced out. And that yeah. possibility is still there, right? Merkel still says... There's going to be no haircut, right? And Schäuble is raving. Schäuble is talking in riddles. He's like the Sphinx or the the Cumaean Sibyl, right? He he doesn't know what he's doing. He he should yeah. be in the in the in the hospital, but uh, you got to be ready. However, if you do have a secret plan B, that makes you stronger because then you can say to Merkel, say, look, we are ready to live without you, and therefore, why don't you back down Merkel? How about this? Does the Greek press say anything about U.S., France, Italy, and IMF pressuring Merkel? Yes, of course. Um, okay, tell us how they see it. Reportedly, Obama calls uh, 
uh, Merkel every night uh, telling her, what, are, what the hell are you doing there? Um, Obama there, calls her every night. Yeah, this is what... This, we, this, somehow this doesn't get through here in the U.S. Yes. And we have France and Italy strong against um, a Grexit, an exit of Greece from the Eurozone. And the thing is that the whole of the West uh, sees this as a geopolitical issue. It, it's, it is insane to view this as some kind of a, an economic or financial um, matter. It is a right. geostrategic matter, and Greece is part of the West. Greece is part of Europe. Uh, Greece is uh, politically moderate since the Yalta conference. It's insane to, um, in effect, uh, throw Greece out of these institutions uh, just, uh, just for economic issues for uh, differences of a few uh, peanuts. Exactly. Um, we, had, we had some quotes from the French uh, Prime Minister Valls. You got any quotes from the Italians? Uh, no, but the, the, the Italian Prime Minister has been vocal um, towards Greece. Um, Greece needs to be, needs, needs help, and Greek society needs help to get out of this crisis. Okay, Michael, we got to run. Thank you. We'll see you next week and uh, talk to you soon. Welcome back to the World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Topley, Washington, D.C. It's Friday, the 10th of July, and we're happy to be joined by Reverend Edward Pinckney, the most famous political prisoner in the United States, carrying the burden of uh, fighting against austerity and for freedom and currently held in atrocious conditions in the Michigan state prison system of uh, this awful governor, Rick Snyder, and his and his friends. Reverend, welcome. Hey, Webster, Webster, I, it is a pleasure to be on your show, and I'm, I'm excited today. I, I, I tell you, uh, we've been gunning for, for things to happen, and things are finally beginning to happen. Uh, we have all the transcripts. At this time, we have filed for the appeal bond on Monday. So I'm, well, so I'm, I'm excited. I'm looking forward uh, uh, to to talking to you uh, uh, soon, or even maybe in person, very, very soon. And I tell you this much, well, sir, I am truly, truly, truly excited. I tell you, as I said, the appeal bond has been filed. It was filed on Monday, and we're going to continue to to monitor it and uh, do the things that need to be done. But here, I, I really need the help of all your listeners right now because we need to get coverage. We need to get media coverage because they're going to be doing everything within their power to make sure that I do not get this appeal by. I mean, if you know anybody who works for, the, for, for any newspaper, any, I don't care where it is or what it does, we need, you need to contact my wife at 269 Nine two five zero 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 one. That's two six nine nine two five zero 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 one. Because we need the coverage so we can out outlast them. That corporate media is going to be targeting me to make sure that I do not get this appeal bond. So they're going to be doing their job, and we got to do our job. Because I believe in fighting back at all costs. Okay, Reverend. Now let's let's maybe get down into a little bit of detail. We're going to have a, a legal opinion, I believe, in the next uh, segment. But what you're doing is you're applying to be out of jail, on bail, uh, pending the appeal, and that's going to go Monday. W what court does that go to, and who is going to decide that? Tell us how it works. Well, it's, it, here it is. Uh, it was filed on Monday, the sixth of July. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it goes to Grand Rapids, Michigan, to the appeal court. And it will be a three-judge panel that will be looking at it. But before they look at it, they're going to have one of their clerks. They're going to review it. And then they're going to pass it on to the panel. And then the panel will make a decision to, uh, to give me an appeal bond. And it goes right back down to the trial court. They can't dispute it. Only thing they can do is honor it and give me a, a bond. It might be a high bond, uh, which I'm expecting it probably will, knowing them, 
uh, who would believe? Because remember, it was thirty thousand uh, dollars for for the uh, uh, the the election, the forgery case itself, which makes no sense. But you knowing them because this would be a real slap right in their face because it shows what you can do when you fight back. Um, so that's the process. It goes from the appeal court in Grand Rapids back down to the trial court, and the only thing they have to do is issue a, a, a bond. That's all they have to do. They can't even challenge it on any level they want to, uh, but they cannot do it. Uh, they cannot hold me up. They cannot do things to, to, to cause problems. Uh, because once the appeal court has spoken, uh, it's final. Uh, but they can appeal it and take it to the Supreme Court, which I do not see that happening. But uh, doing these, these, uh, uh, this criminal enterprise out of uh, out of uh, Barron County, they may try anything. But Webster, I, I, I'm excited today. Uh, we've been trying to uh, do this for the last six and a half months that I've been here in prison. Uh, and we've been trying to do it, trying to make things happen, and finally we have made it happen. It shows what you can do when the people work together. And I want to thank all your listeners, everybody who contributed and, and, and did what they had to do. But it's, it's important right now that I need media coverage. I need even a little bitty newspapers or small newspapers or the one-page newspaper, whatever it takes, I need it. And that's where everybody comes in and work together and make this thing happen. So, Webster, I am excited today. Even though I'm still locked up in prison, even though I still have to eat this food, even though that every day is a thing, is a challenge here, I'm prepared to take it to the next level. And it will not end the fight. It will make me stronger and make me a better warrior. That's what it's all about. All right, so let's let's look at this question. Uh, if you're going to be granted bail, then you got to have bond money, right? And here I appeal also to the uh, to the listeners, right? You got to go to bhbanco.org. So Benton Harbor Black Autonomy Network of Community Organizations. B H B A N C O, all one word, all lowercase. dot org. A little bit over to the right. Scroll down a tiny bit. There's a PayPal. And that's where you can make contributions, and uh, we'll we'll have to see what they what they demand. Uh, you are not a flight risk. You are deeply rooted in that community, right? You have a congregation with oh, thousands I, of people in it. Absolutely, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I you know for the last fifteen years, I went to court every day. It was not a day <laughs> that I wasn't arranged. <laughs> so they they even asked me one day, somebody must be paying you to come here every day. Uh, in this weather, I said, absolutely not. I'm being paid by having these guys get out of jail. That's my target. That's what I do. That's what I was I was put here on earth to do. You see, this is what I tell everybody. I will let nothing, nothing supersede the mission. The mission is the most important thing that people need to know about. When you're on a mission, you have to not allow nothing to stop you because people will stop you. People in here have been trying to stop me. But they can't stop me because if they get in my way, I'm just going to run them over. That's, what, that's what's going to happen because I, I tell you, we got a job to do. We got to make sure we're doing the things that need to be done, and we got to make sure that we're staying focused and doing what has to be done. Well, sir, I, I tell you, it's been an honor and a privilege to be on your show. You, you have really, 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 really been, been just wonderful, and I'm, I'm so proud to just to say that I have been on your show and, doing, and, 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 and you're doing the work that needs to be done. But I definitely need you to get me some media attention. I got to have that attention. I got to have these folks uh, because they're going to have their, because they're going to have Whirlpool supporting them, and they're going to have all the evil, evil, wicked people they can. But we have to make sure we're doing what we need to do. So that's how it operates, Webster. Reverend, I, I also look forward, I think when you're out of jail, right, when you're on bail, you could then begin to write some of these accounts that you've been giving us from week to week about the conditions inside this prison industrial complex, the mass incarceration of poor black uh, Latino Appalachian people and the food. I, I've seen some of your reports about the maggots in the food coming from this um, 
this uh, corporation that runs oh. this entire thing, oh, right? Absolutely. Aramark, uh, Aramark, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Aramark, and uh, we hope you could sit down and uh, and dictate some of this, right? To get get it oh, get I it uh, get it out. Yeah, well, so you know, I'm actually looking forward to it, and, and people need to know exactly what's going on. See, they are supposed to be closing this uh, facility down, uh, this facility itself, but here, here they're putting in three million dollars worth of windows. You have one See, minute remaining. But also, they're hired. They hired about 30, 30 correctional officers for this one place here. Who would believe that if you if you plan on closing this baby down, why would you put new windows inside, you know, try to uh, <laughs> revamp everything and then close it down? But listen, I only got one 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 minute left. I'm afraid that our, our hard break is already coming in, Reverend. So bhbanco.org, and we wish you the very best in the appeal on Monday. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, uh, Webster Tarpley here in Washington. Now, we've just heard from Reverend Edward Pinckney, America's most famous political prisoner. And now we would like to get a uh, legal overview of the same uh, complex of problems. We are honored to be joined by Jeffrey Jackson, Esquire of Texas, who is a leading foreclosure defense attorney, and uh, I always want to compare him to Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life, right? There are lots of families who can say, he saved my house. Uh, Some people said that about Franklin D. Roosevelt. There are a lot of people today who say that about Jeffrey Jackson, and he is the legal uh, advisor to the Tax Wall Street Party. So we are infinitely grateful uh, to Jeffrey Jackson. So, Counselor, uh, we heard from Pinckney. He's told us about a bail bond hearing at the appellate level in the Michigan system, Grand Rapids, on this coming Monday uh, with a three-judge panel, perhaps getting a recommendation from a clerk. Uh, maybe you could put that all in perspective for us. Yes, absolutely, Webster. Thank you for having me on. And you told me before I came on that uh, Reverend Pinckney sounded like he was in good spirits today, and I think he has good reason to be in good spirits, because last uh, Monday, Monday of this week, his, his appellate attorney filed a preliminary brief as to why the Michigan Court of Appeals needs to let him out on bond where the Michigan trial court refused to let him out on bond. And if you'll recall, the trial court found that his prior record of vote fraud, they found that that was the only factor that weighed in favor of keeping him in jail rather than letting him out and back into the community during the uh, appellate process. Every other factor weighed in Reverend Pinckney's favor his longevity in the community, his ties to the community, and whether or not he was a flight risk. So there is a procedure under the Michigan law, specifically MCL 770.9, that allows someone in Reverend Pinckney's position to get a second opinion on this bond. What's taken so long is that when you make this appeal for bond to the Court of Appeals, you have to show essentially a likelihood of success on the appeal itself. So this has necessitated several months worth of briefing, essentially a preliminary brief that looks a lot like what the final briefing is going to look like. So the two best arguments were briefed, and those arguments are that there was insufficient evidence to support the conviction, and that, too, there were blatant violations of the rules of evidence, particularly Rule of Evidence 404B, and that is the corollary to the federal rule of evidence, and Michigan uses the the same uh, style for those rules, so the rule is the same, 404B, and this is what we call in the profession other acts or other bad acts evidence. So... I'm told by Daniela, Daniela Walls, chair 
spokesperson of the Tax Wall Street Party that a copy of this or a PDF of this preliminary brief for bond is now posted on the WordPress site, freepinkneed.wordpress.com. If anyone out there wants to go read it, this is by far the most comprehensive document uh, that's been produced so far that explains exactly why uh, the, the trial uh, should be reversed, he should be let free, uh, and, and essentially not only that he should be let free on bond by, by this brief showing a likelihood of success on the ultimate briefing, but, but why the ultimate briefing is a no-brainer, in my opinion, uh, that the trial should have never taken place and that the conduct of the trial was completely in violation of Michigan law and the rules of evidence. So this is a big deal, and I believe from a legal perspective, it's going to be very, very, very difficult for the state of Michigan to file a, a, re, a reply that is going to be able uh, really to make any chinks in these very sound legal arguments uh, that Reverend Pinckney's excellent Michigan appellate attorney has made. And there's a lot of people behind this brief. I helped out with this brief. The ACLU in Michigan helped out with this brief. And so the, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident in the legal team behind this appellate work. And I believe, I believe that um, it's, it's, it's going to become clear when the Michigan Court of Appeals starts to rule in Reverend Pinckney's favor that the Berrien County prosecutor uh, really only brought this case because it was Edward Pinckney. What we've been arguing all along, that the only evidence presented that tended to show his guilt in any way, shape, or form uh, was evidence comp that was inflammatory, prejudicial, and completely improper. They tried to prove his guilt by just proving that he had historical animus to government officials and to Whirlpool. And you cannot, you absolutely cannot use his prior political acts as evidence to show that he changed dates on petition forms. That cannot be any evidence. And that's the only evidence that they produced with any substance. And I think what we're going to have here is, is, is we're going to be able to form the ultimate conclusion that they knew they didn't have a case, and they brought it as a punitive measure, because even if they knew they'd probably get reversed by the Court of Appeals, they've still managed to essentially get what they wanted, which is Reverend Pinckney convicted and, and wrongfully put in jail now for, I, gosh, I don't even know how long it's been now. Over Reverend six said uh, six, six and a half months on the current uh, stint. Right. So I, I encourage everyone out there to go read this document because... Hang on, it, hang on Counselor. We're, we're going to just get you back at the beginning of the next segment to round up a, a couple of things, okay? Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C., on the phone with Jeffrey Jackson, a distinguished attorney in Texas. Uh, he's been uh, a foreclosure defense lawyer, has helped many families stay in their homes, legal advisor to the Tax Wall Street Party. Jeffrey, I wonder if I could just ask you, when you were going through this, it sounds to me, and maybe I'll just ask you the two things and you respond to both. It sounds like you could make a case for selective and vindictive prosecution and that they were also simply doing a kind of character assassination in the court, saying you're a bad guy and therefore we'll put you away, something like that. 
Right, right. That's exactly right. Um, I'll answer the, the, the second part first. It's very clear that you have to have some direct evidence that he changed dates on petitions. That was the charge. You cannot, under the rules of evidence, which go back centuries to the English common law, you cannot use the fact that he didn't like and that he had historically opposed Mayor Hightower and others associated with him and other figures in the county, you cannot put that before the jury as evidence that he forged dates on the petition to recall Mayor Hightower. It is completely improper evidence, um, and, and, and that's clear under the other acts rule of evidence 404B. And not only did Judge Schrock let that evidence before the jury, when it should have never come before the jury, but it was their only evidence. Mm. So it's it's really, it, it, and, and that leads into the the first part of your question: could it could it be that this was a vindictive prosecution? Does this seem to indicate it was a victi- a vindictive prosecution? Based on everything I've read, the answer to that is yes. Now, it may very well be that they have created for themselves enough plausible deniability that they're not going to, um, you know, face any kind of ramifications for what does appear to me to be a vindictive prosecution. Uh, However, if we can build up, um, you know, enough media attention and build up enough popular support, and we can get the appellate court to start ruling in in Reverend Pinckney's favor, then I can imagine a, a scenario where um, they, they could be held to task for conducting the prosecution in the first place. Okay. Um, and, and so I would, I would encourage everyone uh, again, to go read the document and to continue to write letters. And uh, I think there was one particular person who was interested in uh, filing a complaint with the Michigan Bar. And I think that that, that is also a, a very good route um, to uh, refer the bar to the activities of Prosecutor Sepik, and the bar can conduct its own investigation into the prosecution of this case and potentially uncover unethical acts uh, by the Berrien County prosecutor. Um, and, and if we can get the Court of Appeals to start ruling in Edward Pinckney's favor, then, then that is going to be um, you know, the, the first steps in uh, getting perhaps some authorities in Michigan to take a closer look at the historical um, facts regarding this, this prosecution of, of, of Reverend Pinckney. Now, uh, limited time, so my last question is, uh, on Monday, uh, the 12th of July, I guess, um, what are the mechanics of what happens? In other words, a ruling comes out of this Grand Rapids Appeals Court, or how do you see that uh, coming about, just for people who want to follow it sort of hour by hour? Well, um, you, you, you can follow what happens in the case. I think um, it updates relatively quickly, 24 to 48 hours. There is a, a web search. If you just simply Google State uh, or Court of Appeals of Michigan, and you type in the case number, which is 325-856, that's 325-856, you can track the the pleadings and the decisions of the court uh, via the Michigan Court of Appeals website just by typing in that case number. What I, I'm not, I'm a Texas lawyer, so I'm not completely familiar with these appellate procedures, but what I believe is going to happen is that um, the uh, case will be presented orally and essentially the same points made in the written brief and a clerk there at the Court of Appeals who 
is charged with you know reading the brief will advise the uh, the panel of judges whether or not um, that clerk and then ultimately the, the judges believe that Reverend Pinckney will ultimately be successful uh, in the uh, in the appeal upon the final briefing being done. And okay, then, wonderful. And then, and then they will set they will set the amount of the bond based on. Um, you know, those same factors, flight risk, ties to the community, as well as likelihood of his ultimate success. All right. So that's what we'll be uh, we'll be looking for on Monday. Let me just repeat that. It's case number three, two, five, eight, five, six in the Michigan Court of Appeals website system. And uh, I would also add, if, if people want to follow my Twitter, Webster G. Tarpley, I'll, I'll certainly put that up there as soon as I know anything. So uh, this would not be complete without a great vote of thanks to uh, Jeffrey Jackson in Texas, who has gone out of his way to devote, I guess by now, hundreds of hours, maybe more, uh, to this case, right? And this is an example of um, making the court system work for the, the values of freedom and, and the rule of law, even in the face of this atrocious company town of uh, Barbarian County and the uh, and the whirlpool uh, yoke, which is now on on the on the poor people of that area. So it's going to be a victory for freedom. So thank you very much, Jeffrey, and we'll see you. We'll see you soon. Maybe next week for sure. Get you back so you can tell us what happened and why. I I will be available and thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you thank for you. the kind words, Webster. Bye bye. Great. Bye bye. Jeffrey Jackson of Texas. Right there's a. There's a real lawyer. There's somebody who actually believes in the law and not just uh, other uh, other extraneous factors. <clears throat> now, I now have to turn my attention to these ultra lefts, the Greek ultra lefts in particular, or ultra lefts anywhere, uh, who uh, say, "Well, no, uh, you can't uh, maneuver. You can't temporize. You've got to uh, do a frontal attack on a." Uh, on a uh, superior enemy who's going to destroy you. So you go down in a blaze of glory, but then you leave all the people uh, behind. Let's go back to this Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And I, I choose this because I'm going to talk about Lenin. And I'm not going to talk about Lenin because I think Lenin is a paragon of anything. But I think some of the people who are yelping and whining the loudest in the KKE uh, about, you know, having to... Uh, you know, essentially face up to the fact that you're if you're weak and isolated, you know, you've got to gain some time and you got to make concessions. But then maybe before too long, you can take them back. So let's uh, let's look into that. Right? You can see all kinds of people who write about this. Uh, the book about Brest Litovsk is from um, uh, John Wheeler Bennett of British Intelligence. And there's a there's a book by the leading Trotskyist, Tony Cliff. So we'll be back in just a minute to give you a summary on that and how uh, you got to sometimes take um, a step back in order to take two steps forward. Reculer pour mieux sauter. Right? Pull back so you can jump better. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Now, this is my... My message to the ultra lefts. I'm going to talk to you in your own language, and I'm going to urge you to be realists. Principle, yes, and realism. And if you're interested in some kind of world revolution, you got to be a realist. And here's what it looks like. Uh, we we know that at the end of 1917, right, about a year after the uh, February, almost a year after the February Revolution, and then after the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks are in power. They made a truce, first of all, a truce with Germany. Germany had penetrated way into Ukraine. They had taken all of Poland. They were in the Baltic states. They were uh, certainly within striking distance of St. Petersburg. So just visited. Uh, they could have perhaps gone on to to Moscow, right? So it was. Uh, this was a uh, a desperate situation. And therefore, there was this negotiation going on at Brest-Litovsk, where you had uh, all the parties, right? You had Germany, you had Russia, you had uh, this Ukrainian puppet state of the Germans, you had the Ottoman Empire, you had Austria-Hungary. And the question was, uh, what will you do? Well, 
First of all, the Germans made this bread piece that we talked about last year, right, to get all those, uh, you know, those million tons of, uh, of grain and the eggs and the meat and the uh, other raw materials they thought they could get from Ukraine. So that's the bread piece, recognizing Ukraine. But then there's the question, uh, will the Germans break out of the truce, the armistice that had been set up, and will they continue on the road to St. Petersburg and then maybe Moscow? Um, so got to put it in a nutshell, essentially the German terms were extremely draconian and Lenin, I think act, acting as a realist and again, not wanting to endorse Lenin and certainly not wanting to compare Tsipras to Lenin or anything of that kind, but simply wanting to do a lesson of realism. It was something like this, March 3rd, 1918, the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. By this agreement, Russia lost 34% of her population, 34, one third of the entire population, 32% of her agricultural land, 85% of the sugar beet land, 54% of industrial firms, 89% of the coal mines. Now that is draconian. That is so shocking that the uh, when these these terms were formulated by Ludendorff, right, the proto-Nazi, the guy's going to become the sponsor of Hitler, taking part in the beer hall putsch of 1923. So Ludendorff wants all this stuff. Uh, the German uh, negotiator from the foreign ministry, Kuhlmann, is shocked. He said, my God, I can't believe my own government is asking for all this stuff. So the question then for the Bolsheviks became, what do you do? Uh, what do you do? So uh, let me just – I want to give you another version, if I can, of, uh, of the uh, – let's see. According to, to Tony Cliff, it's like this. Russia loses 1,267,000 square miles of territory, 62 million of population, one-fourth of the territory, 44 percent of the population, one-third of the crops, 27 percent of state income, 80 percent of sugar factories, 73 percent of iron, 75 percent of coal. Out of 16,000 industrial firms in the Russian Empire, 9,000 are in the lost territories. So Lenin says, either you take that or you're going to be destroyed by the German army, which just won't stop. There's nothing to stop them. There is no Red Army at this point. There's nothing. So you've got to do something about it. Now, it's uh, Trotsky, uh, who is in some ways the guy who has to negotiate all this stuff, is in, he vacillates. He's in a kind of a middle position, eventually comes over uh, to Lenin, but not fast. In many ways, it's Lenin by himself who forces this down the throat of the Bolshevik Politburo and Central Committee. And there are these people like um, the ultra left Radek strikes me, right? Radek comes comes essentially from Germany. He's got this publication, The Torch, right? The Fackel. And he says, wait, wait a minute, don't do that. There's going to be a revolution in Germany any day now. And Lenin replies, well, that I can't bet everything on that because suppose they you know, they take a six month uh, delay. So you can't do that. Uh, Radek had just come in, you know, he was not a Russian. He came in from Germany, or he had some background, but most of the time in Germany, a little bit like Varoufakis, right? Coming back from Australia, from the US, and all these other things, and maybe not so much in touch with the average Greek who wants to stay in the Euro, right? They don't want the adventure of this unless you can show it to them in practice that this is being forced on you by Merkel and Schäuble and Draghi and this awful Manfred Weber, who has insulted the Greeks. I mean, this was racism. This was hate speech, what this guy was coming up with. So uh, big fight. And uh, a lot of these characters uh, in, the, in the Central Committee were, were simply uh, raving, right? They said, oh, there's going to be a revolution in Bulgaria. There's going to be a revolution in, in uh, Romania and, and so forth. So uh, you can't bet everything on that. And there was a rebellion in the St. Petersburg Communist Party, Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, Bolsheviks. Um, Bukharin, Radek, Uritsky, 
Um, others, Preo uh, Brzezinski, what a shame. Kolon Tai, um, Lomov. Uh, a lot of them were in this, uh, you know, we got to fight the Revolutionary War, except uh, there's nothing to fight with, right? And the German army is very formidable. So when you're dealing with that, you got to temporize, you got to maneuver. And then what happened? Well, uh, interestingly, the Germans then collapsed seven months later. <laughs> By gaining time, you put yourself in a position where you can take back some of this. Now, the ultimate disposition of the Russian border depends then on the Russian against Polish war of 1920. Uh, but if that had gone differently, the Russians might have been able, the Soviets might have been able to take back more of Poland, uh, more of Ukraine, uh, the Baltic states. Uh, they might have um, solved that problem. So in other words, they it kept open a lot of possibilities. As it actually happened, the Germans left and then this belt of new independent states, weak states, Poland and so forth, emerged. Uh, Ukraine did not remain uh, independent, so that problem was solved. And, uh, and what you then had was cordon sanitaire, right? So a belt of weak states between uh, Soviet Russia, Soviet Union on the one hand and, and Western Europe on the other. But uh, by the time then of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, uh, 1939, they got back a lot of that, Russia did, and by 1945, they got back all of it. Now, I'm not proposing you have to wait 25 years to get anything back. I'm simply trying to say Merkel is not strong. She's a minority. She's looking more like a lame duck. We're told that there are fights between Merkel and Schäuble, that they don't get along. A little bit like Varoufakis, right? Schäuble has been has been out there uh, in the in the midst of the fray, but he's also been eased out of some of the negotiations. And there's a lot of hotheads in there, with the pressure of the U.S. Right? What we're hearing: U.S., France, Italy, and even the IMF. Amazing. When you're in a position where you think the IMF is soft, <laughs> then you can see how how far out on a limb. This Merkel Schäuble clique or Merkel clique has actually uh, gone. So um, that's what I would recommend. The example of the Treaty of Brest Litovsk is that if you uh, want to survive, you got to survive. And Spisa uh, has to survive. The big problem is get yourself some allies, get countries, get parties, get countries. We're going to be on your side. That's what the time. So has to organize internationally. Not that'll never be enough. Back in uh, next week on World Crisis Radio, World Crisis Radio, coming your way next. Week.